the sovereignty of God is one of the most comforting truths. The sovereignty of God is one of the most comforting truths. I've said it, I think probably a few times at least, during this time when we've been looking at the life of Joseph in the book of Genesis, and it continues uh, hitting me. And uh, this reality, not just obviously in the story of Joseph, but all of the Bible, but the reality that God really is sovereign and that He really rules over all. He rules over the most minute detail, the smallest annoyance and, and uncertainties and whatever things surprise us in our lives. And He also rules over the biggest things that you know, change the fate of nations and rulers and kingdoms rise and fall and everything in between. God is sovereign. He rules. He is in control. An even more simple way of saying that is, is that God is God. He is God. And His hand is not too short. He's not too far to not know or notice, but He is in full and total control. And as we now approach toward the end of the book of Genesis, uh, I have uh, I kind of counted it now finally. I was like, okay, I've got five sermons to go. So for those of you who might be... So five more, this one included five sermons to go, and then we're done, God willing, with the book of Genesis. And uh, it nicely also... Uh, I wasn't planning it as such, but it nicely ends like my summer holiday thing will start then and then we'll have other sermons. So we get just Genesis done then uh, before that. Uh, and um, yeah, then we'll begin another book of the Bible in the future. But five more times in the book of Genesis... And now we come to a unique point here in the book of Genesis, chapter 45, verse 16 onward, and also chapter 46. And this theme of the sovereignty of God is interwoven in of this whole story of Joseph and everything that's happened. But now we're coming to the point of the kind of final culmination of the Joseph story. The history of Joseph and his father Jacob and Jacob's other sons, Joseph's brothers. And we come to this point where after 23 years, Jacob will finally now meet his long-lost son again. 23 years has passed since Joseph left Canaan as he was sold by his brothers, almost murdered, and all the different events that we've been looking at. And now we're seeing how God God's hand has been in all of this, as we've seen and will continue to see. God's sovereign, wise plan. And uh, we will begin here in Genesis 45, as I said, and verse 16. Just a little reminder where we were before this. Verse 15 there in this chapter says, And he kissed all his brothers and wept upon them. After that his brothers talked with him. We've seen last time as we were in Genesis, we saw that Joseph's test to his brothers were finally over and it accomplished what he was seeking to do. And his brothers kind of redeemed themselves. They were, now they were acting as honest men. They were faithful men and, and repentant men. And there's been this reunion uh, of, of uh, tears of joy together. Now we are in the aftermath of that. We were told earlier already that Pharaoh's house heard Joseph crying, but it's still a bit like, what's going on? We remember that Joseph said everyone out except him and his brothers, and then he, he had this you know, emotional meeting with his brothers. 
That's where we pick up the story. Verse 16 in Genesis 45. When the report was heard in Pharaoh's house, Joseph's brothers have come. It pleased Pharaoh and his servants. So now, the situation has calmed down. Emotion, okay, now the news goes. And okay, what, what's happening with Joseph? What's all this crying and commotion and what's going on? And it's like his brothers, Joseph's brothers have come. And this pleases Pharaoh. And think about Pharaoh again, this great ruler. Who is Joseph to him? At this point, Joseph is the most important person in some ways to him. He's the man who was able to supernaturally interpret the dreams and lead then all of Na Egypt in a kind of a situation where they're able to uh, keep enough of grain. And now as the years of famine have come and they're in the middle of it, uh, he's seeing that, yeah, this is the man. And he, he I mean, in some ways he has... He, well, I guess Pharaoh could have maybe survived with food and stuff, but he has to thank for the continuance of his kingdom in many ways and, and all that to this man, Joseph. And so undoubtedly he's become very uh, close in many ways, his right-hand man, Joseph. And then to hear that his family, his brothers have come, then it's like, well, Great, you know, like it's a joyful thing for you and I, I want to somehow show my appreciation to you toward your family. And they're happy about this and Pharaoh's servants also, I mean, if Pharaoh is happy about something, his servants <laughs> should be as well, obviously. And then Pharaoh says to Joseph, say to your brothers, do this. And notice here, Pharaoh is now, he's basically saying the same kind of things that Joseph has already uh, extended this uh, invitation, go and get my father and then come here and I'll take care of you. But at the end of the day, Pharaoh is still Pharaoh. And Pharaoh is now, give, so that there's not, no ambiguity, unclearness, who is giving the charge. In the end, Pharaoh is giving his stamp of approval to Joseph's kind of plans. And even more, he's making the invitation even more lavish. And as we see here, it is not even just a suggestion. It's like a command from Pharaoh. You need to come, you know, like you, I insist. You need to come and you're going to have the best of the land. He says, say to your brothers, do this, load your beasts and go back to the land of Canaan and take your father and your households and come to me and I will give you the best of the land of Egypt and you shall eat the fat of the land. And then verse 19, and you, Joseph, are commanded to say, See, Pharaoh is like giving even this, it's not just, uh, again, an idea, suggestion, he's making it very emphatic. This is a command, it's a command of Pharaoh himself. And this will obviously be like then important if any of uh, Pharaoh's servants would then sound like, well, who, what are these Hebrews coming and why are they given this and whatever and kind of begrudgingly and you know jealous or something like that well it's not just that Joseph gave the command and kind of hatred to Pharaoh not only gave his approval but Pharaoh gave it as a command so if you have a problem with the way now Jacob and his family are welcomed and lavishly welcomed into Egypt you have a problem with the, the king of the land Pharaoh himself because he has made it very emphatically clear that this is his command and, and this is what they are to do. And he says, command, commanded, Joseph, you are commanded to say this, do this, take wagons from the land of Egypt for your little ones and for your wives and bring your father and come. Have no concern for your goods, for the best of all the land of Egypt is yours. So notice, it's not simply come here and you're welcome and here's maybe some food. No, here's wagons to make your journey easier for women, children, also old Jacob. And then, like, don't worry about packing up your stuff because you'll have all stuff here. Uh, and you're going to get not just something, but you're going to get the best of the land 
of Egypt. Lavishly promising to lavishly uh, receive them into Egypt. An interesting thing here, as you think, you know, I don't think, obviously, we wouldn't be in a similar situation at all, just being a, you know, monarch of a great nation or anything like that. But it's interesting, this language, uh, I, a few things that I kind of, uh, about the, the way we could say the best, okay, come to my house and I'll give you the best that I have, I'll put the best meal or whatever, I'll give you the best hospitality. But something that we probably wouldn't necessarily say, many of us, is you shall eat the fat of the land. And the kind of fat in a very positive way. And I think this is especially in our society and food culture for the most part. Uh, I also remember kind of thinking and in the schooling system and food and what is healthy and not. Fat is often looked down upon. Fat, fat, you know, fat, every all fat is bad. Uh, certainly there are uh, things that you shouldn't eat, but it's just a little, little reminder for us from a biblical point of view and the way God has created the world that maybe fat isn't as bad of a thing as we often think of it. And it's actually something of the the most nutritious and valuable things in uh, animals and such. And that's why it's then, obviously it doesn't mean that I just have big blobs of fat for you to eat and enjoy, but it is that most valuable thing, the fat of the land, the abundance, and, uh, and uh, the actual fat of even animals is a symbol of that. And, and they understood uh, many things about animals and nutrition that some of us Moderns have maybe, yeah, thought that we, <laughs> we've got it better, but at the same time, our society seems to be sicker in every way than previous generations before, even though we have a lot of medical advancements, obviously thankful for. But anyway, the fat of the land, the best of the land, this is for you, and this is the command, this is the invitation and command of Pharaoh. Then, what happens? Well, they do what is commanded. They do what is commanded. Verse 21, the sons of Israel did so. And Joseph gave them wagons according to the, notice, command of Pharaoh. Command of Pharaoh. And gave them provisions for the journey. And then, verse 22, to each and all of them, he gave a change of clothes. I mentioned this earlier also in uh, chapter 44. So, do you remember when clothes have last time been mentioned here? What did these sons of Israel do with their clothes? Genesis 44 verse 13. Then they tore their clothes, and every man loaded his donkey, and they returned to the city. They found out about this, and I mentioned then that again, even us, even me, like trying to break my shirt or something here would be like, why, he's really making a statement. But, you know, clothes are quite cheap nowadays. They're produced somewhere, I guess most of it in China or somewhere, and it, it is very... Uh, something you could you could go to some H&M or whatever and buy a lot of clothes for quite a lot little money at the end of the day because we have big machines and factories that make them back then clothes were much more valuable and something you couldn't just throw around and change every day as such and to then be given uh, clothes and some unique special kind of gifts from royalty is a, is a big, great gift. And also then, I think part of the reason is here again, these are the same brothers who recently tore their clothes, maybe they fixed them up a little bit, and now Joseph is providing for them. And think about that. Think about the kind of the irony of this all. Who is Joseph? Joseph is their brother, the one who was given a jacket, by his father and father's uh, kind of wrong uh, 
selective love toward only Joseph and favoritism, which caused a lot of trouble. But still, he gave this coat, and then the brothers hated him, wanted to murder him, took the uh, clothes off him, planned to kill him, but they eventually ended up selling him. They took clothes from him, and they sold him, and they received money for this, and now they've been covering this up for basically 23 years with this guilty conscience. Now God has changed in his sovereignty, led this man, uh, Joseph, through a lot of trials and pain and suffering and brought him to this point so that then Joseph will be a vehicle of blessing to his brothers and that through him these brothers even will be changed. And now this brother is giving them clothes. He is clothing them. They're the ones who unclothed him and wanted to kill him. He is giving them clothes and he is giving them money he's already given them a lot of money and will continue to how things have changed he gave them change of clothes but to Benjamin he gave 300 shekels of silver and five changes of clothes so we've seen this before that he part of his testing was earlier when he gave a, a food to Benjamin a lot we'll see Will, will they try to be jealous because Benjamin is, Benjamin is basically Joseph Jr. in some ways. He's the other favorite son of Jacob, the other son of Rachel, the youngest in the family. And he gives him five changes of clothes uh, uh, to, to show, kind of to honor him and such. And, and this big sum of money. Then... He also sends a unique gift to his father. Verse 23. To his father he sent as follows. Ten donkeys loaded with the good things of Egypt. Ten female donkeys loaded with grain, bread and provisions for his father on the journey. Then he sent his brothers away and they departed. And he said to them, do not quarrel on the way. So now they're sent and this big gift package to his father. And as we'll see later on, I believe this is quite important that as then the brothers come and they tell the news to the father, and we'll see in just a moment, then the fact that there's these 20 loaded animals with like, it's like, where did you get this? You didn't have money to buy this. Like, what, like that itself will be like unexplainable unless there's some really unexpected explanation to this which he'll find out, uh, Jacob the father. But as they then go and they depart, they have all this, Joseph gives them a final word of warning and advice, do not quarrel on the way. Why would he tell his brothers, do not quarrel on the way? Well, he obviously knows his brothers, he knows what they're capable, of, at least in the kind of past life and such. But why specifically also now that they're going back? Well, they now have to go back and tell their father the stuff that they've been hiding for over 20 years. And it, Joseph recognizes that this can easily kind of start escalating into like, well, well you say, well, but you did that. You did, how are we going to do this? How are we going to tell him that Joseph is alive and we covered it up and we've known and, and well, your response, you know, and you start like a fight between them. They started quarreling. There was recipe for a lot of quarrel. He says, remember, do not quarrel on the way. They have to sort it out and they have to plan and okay, Okay, who's going to tell him how we're going to do it? Yeah. But do not quarrel. We're not told what they discuss, how the journey goes, but presumably everything goes well. And then we are told in verse 25, when they arrive in the land of Canaan, most likely they are back in Hebron, where Jacob is most likely still living. Verse 25 tells us, So they went up out of Egypt and came to the land of Canaan to their father Jacob. Jacob again. Jacob is an old man here now. Jacob has gone through a lot. He thinks Joseph is dead. 
He's been thinking this for over 20 years, 23 years. And now they took Benjamin with him, the other favorite. And he was like, he was willing to die before even giving Benjamin. And Benjamin has, and now they've been a while. And now Jacob is there, you know, probably waiting and like, oh, will they come back? And it's like, Benjamin is lost as well. Or maybe they're all lost. What's, what's happened? He's living in this uncertainty. And verse 26 simply tells us, they, they come, and they prob I mean, he, he probably sees Benjamin right away. Maybe it's not mentioned there. But Benjamin is obviously with them. And then they tell him, Joseph is still alive. And he is the ruler over all the land of Egypt. We kind of just read this, we know the story, this is not a surprise to us, but try and put yourself in the boots of Jacob. Jacob with all his failures and, and, and weaknesses, but still a faithful man of God. He has been living 23 years thinking that Joseph is dead. He has been living like that. And suddenly he's told, Joseph is still alive. I can't imagine the kind of the emotional turmoil and the confusion that that kind of a situation would be. That's why the verse tells us there, and his heart became numb. He didn't feel. He's like, he's in this like shock. Have you ever been in a situation, not like this, none of us have been in it like that, but have you been in little situations where you just feel, is this really happening? I can think at least a few right away. Most of those are kind of negative, sadly, examples. Like, I'm like, I can't believe this. Like, is this person really saying and doing these things? Or is this really happening? Whatever it is. But it's, it's just like, in that moment, I'm like, is this real? It feels so unreal. Like, I can't believe this is really happening. I'm kind of confused for a second. That is this reality what just I'm experiencing here? Even in little things like that. And then to have your beloved son, if you thought, and suddenly he's, he's alive. It's just like the, the, the confusion the emotional turmoil. His heart became numb. He shocked. He does like he can't compute. He doesn't understand. <coughs> and he does not believe them. They simply, we're, this is all that we've told here, that what they tell, Joseph is still alive and he is the ruler over all the land of Egypt. So right away, there's obviously so many questions. Well, well how, like, how can he be alive? But you, you, you gave me the bloody coat of him and uh, what, like, uh, and to be scared of even thinking that Obviously, there's in some ways then the joy, but the, the scaredness, like, if, you, if there's even a chance that this is wrong, what you're saying, you know, I don't, I don't want to uh, risk of, of believing what, what you're trying to tell me. His heart became numb. He's put into shock. And he's obviously in this state for a while. But then verse 27 tells us, but when they told him all the words of Joseph, they keep on talking, then he's probably this old man sitting down and, and just like, don't, like, what's going on? They tell him, and undoubtedly here, even though it's not uh, explicitly told us, but part of this had to be then somehow their confession of what really then happened and the fact that Joseph has forgiven them and that there is reconciliation. And even then, just J Jacob, when he finally comes around, he's still, he's like, okay, whatever then happened, whatever you did, okay, and you've sorted it out, you've forgiven, but Joseph is alive. Joseph is alive. They keep on telling the words of Joseph, which he had said to them. 
And then notice here, and when he saw the wagons that Joseph had sent to carry him, so he sees a tangible example of it's not just these brothers who obviously aren't always very trustworthy because they've been lying before. Now he's finding out and he's uh, unsure to trust them fully. And in this his confusion, his, as his heart is numb, sees these tangible examples of the gifts that Joseph has sent. Then the spirit of their father, Jacob, revived. Like, it's kind of like life goes back into him and now he's able to process what has been told of him and he realizes it is true. And notice what happens here as we're describing this man Jacob. Notice as I've been reading, it's been, they came to their father Jacob, verse 25. Then uh, verse 27, they told everything that Joseph had said, and the spirit of their father, who? Jacob, revived. And then right away, the next verse, and Jacob said? No, it doesn't say, and Jacob said. So it just said Jacob revived, and then right away it says, and Israel said. Jacob is Israel. And they are synonymous, you know, words in that sense. But there seems to be, in most places, in the book of Genesis, when there is an emphasis on Jacob's name, there's more of an emphasis on just him and his kind of weakness and his failings, Jacob the deceiver. And then when Jacob suddenly, in the same sentence, changes into Israel, there seems to be an emphasis of, well, it's not just Jacob for Jacob and Jacob alone, but Jacob is Israel. He's the patriarch of Israel, and from him will come the tribes of Israel. And he's now again stepping up to the plate, so to say. He's stepping up to be the leader that God has called him to be in his family. And he's been revived. And now it's not just Jacob who in that sense is speaking. It is Israel who is speaking, and he's the leader of Israel at this point, this small group, but, but 70 people or so, which later will become this uh, larger nation. And Israel said, it is enough. Joseph, my son, is still alive. I will go and see him before I die. It is enough. Joseph, my son, is still alive. I will go to see him before I die. He's, he's expecting himself to die very soon. And he's like, this is the final thing I'm probably going to do. But I will go and I will go there. What news is being told? What an amazing thing that God has done. Even when wicked men have done wicked things, God has had his sovereign plan and purpose in all of this. But what does Israel now do? Obviously, he's like, Joseph, I'm going to see him. And he's going to see Joseph. But does he just pack his bags? Because he does seem to pack still some, obviously, even though he's told not to take any, but he takes some stuff. And he goes, but does he go straight to Egypt to see Joseph? That's the only thing I care about. Joseph, my son. No, he doesn't do that. He doesn't. Before he goes to Egypt, before he completely leaves Canaan, he goes to a specific place called Beersheba. Now in chapter 46, as we continue reading this, the next verse here, 46 verse 1 so Israel took his journey with all that he had. So now his sons and their wives and children and everything, all that they have, and came to where? Beersheba. And offered sacrifices to the God of his father Isaac. What is Beersheba? There's a place, and this has been mentioned to us in the book of Genesis multiple times. Let me remind you briefly. Genesis chapter 21, verse 31. This is 
Abraham, he is making a covenant with Abimelech. They cut a covenant between themselves. So Abraham, which is Jacob's grandfather, the one called by Yahweh, who is given the initial promise of the Abrahamic covenant. And verse 31, therefore that place, that place where Abraham cut the covenant with Abimelech was called Beersheba, because there both of them swore an oath. So they made a covenant at Beersheba. Then Abimelech and Phicol, the commander of his armor, rose up and returned to the land of the Philistines. Abraham planted a tamarisk tree in Beersheba and called there on the name of Yahweh, the everlasting God. And Abraham sojourned many days in the land of the Philistines. Abraham, the beginning of the family line, obviously Adam is the beginning, but at this point, the one who is called from a pagan uh, past and given the Abrahamic promise of which Jacob is a descendant of that, he makes a covenant with Abimelech, but not only that, he there plants a tree in Beersheba, and not only that, he specifically calls on the name of the Lord, calls on the name of Yahweh, the everlasting God. He prays, he, he offers his thanksgiving, his praise and sacrifice to his God in this specific location, Beersheba. He calls on Yahweh, the creator of heaven and earth. Then Genesis 26 Verse 23, this is Isaac, who is Isaac, Abraham's son, Jacob's father. <clears throat> so Genesis 26, 20, uh, 23, from there he went up to Beersheba, and the Lord appeared to him the same night and said, I am the God of Abraham, your father. Fear not, for I am with you and will bless you and multiply your offspring for my servants Abraham's sake. So he built an altar there and called upon the name of Yahweh and pitched his tent there. And there Isaac's servant dug a well. So now the second generation of the Abrahamic promise, Isaac, he's again in the same location where his father called upon the Lord in a unique way. And now he, we're told specifically, he even builds an altar. He builds a physical altar and offers sacrifice, it seems there, then part of as he's calling upon the name of his God in Beersheba. And notice how there, as God appears to Isaac, he reminds Isaac of, I am the God of who? Abraham, your father. He's the God of heaven and earth. And everybody, in a unique way, he's given his promise to Abraham and called Abraham to be the vehicle through whom all the nations of the earth will receive blessing, ultimately, in the Lord Jesus Christ. So his father Isaac was there and built an altar there. And Jacob himself, it seems then, he, he lived in this place. In Genesis 28, verse 10, Jacob left Beersheba and went toward Haran. So it seems that then, then that Jacob was living with his father Isaac in this location as well. So this was not just any location on the way to Egypt, random place to stop at. But I believe as Jacob revived, and as he had his plan and his faith in his God, and he was strengthened in a unique way again, he knows exactly what he's going to do. But he also has a little bit of a concern, and I believe that's the reason why he goes there. And the concern is that in Genesis 36, verse 2, his father Isaac had been prohibited to go to Egypt. Genesis 26, verse 2, And the Lord appeared to him and said, Do not go down to Egypt. 
Dwell in the land of which I shall tell you. Sojourn in this land and I will be with you and I will bless you. For to you and to your offspring I will give all these lands and I will establish the oath that I swore to Abraham your father. I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and I will give to your offspring all these lands. And in your offspring all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes and my laws. Isaac specifically was told, don't you go to Egypt, even if it might be too tempting. You stay here. This is the place I've given you and I will give to your descendants. So now then Jacob, of course he wants to see his son Joseph. And he understands there's a famine going on. And he seems to, you know, like, well, God seems to providentially be opening the doors and opportunities. And it seems to be the right thing to go to Egypt, at least to visit but at the same time, I'm sure there's this a little bit nagging like, should I be going, Lord? Should I be? Or would I be disobeying you if I take all that I have and now leave Canaan, which has been promised to us? In this, as he, before he leaves Egypt, before he goes to Egypt, before he leaves Canaan, he goes to this place where his grandfather and his father in unique ways have worshipped the one true God. And he goes there himself and he does what? He offers sacrifices to the God of his father Isaac. And I think that's even the reason it's kind of termed that way there is to remind us again that Isaac used to be there in the connection with Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. I am the God and father of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob as God himself likes to say in multiple places in the Old Testament and the New Testament. But he goes, he goes before his God and offers sacrifice. He worships his God. We're not told does he say what specifically he says? But if I would guess, and I don't think I would be far off, I think one of the things he would be worshipped to God is like, Lord, clarify that it is the right thing for me to go in here, that I'm not doing anything wrong, right? Or like, uh, what's your purpose for our family? And God speaks to him. Jacob approaches in humble worship toward his God. And verse 2 tells, And God spoke to Israel in visions of the night and said, Jacob, Jacob. Probably even here again. Notice, what does he say, Israel, Israel? We're just told he spoke to Israel and that was Jacob, Jacob. Well... It is his father, Jacob's father, not just Isaac. I mean, the father of fathers, our almighty father, who now speaks to his servant, Jacob. And Jacob, Jacob recognizes weaknesses, his frailty, and probably his uncertainty again at this, that is this what I should be doing? And Jacob responds saying, here I am. Then God says, I am God, the God of your father. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt. For there I will make you into a great nation. I myself will go down with you to Egypt. And I also will bring you up again. And Joseph's hand shall close your eyes. God in his kindness gives this comforting vision to Jacob and saying, remember who I am. I am the faithful covenant keeping God, the God of your father Isaac, the God of your father Abraham, the God who has created all things. And do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. And then God before, again, so Jacob is going, he's going with all his family and he's going there and he realizes he wants to see Joseph, but also they don't have really food anymore there and it's a difficult situation. But at this point, it's not 100% sure how long they're going to then be there. But in God's comment here, notice, 
Don't be afraid to go down to Egypt, for there I will make you into a great nation. This is kind of the first thing that, okay, yes, okay, I guess we'll be quite long in Egypt. Because we'll become a great nation while we're there. And yes, that's what's going to happen. And that's actually what God had told quite a long time ago already in Genesis 15. So this is now the beginning of the fulfillment of an earlier prophecy that God gave to Abraham. So even before Abraham's name was changed from Abram to Abraham, God gave this promise part of us. He was give, making the covenant with Abram in Genesis 15 verse 12. It says this, As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram, and behold, dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. Then the Lord said to Abram, Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs, and will be servants there, and they will be afflicted for 400 years. But I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve, and afterwards they shall come out with great possessions. As for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace, you shall be buried in a good old age, and they shall come back here in the fourth generation, for the iniquity of the Amorites is yet complete. God had said this before even Isaac was born, let alone Jacob or Joseph or anything. And he'd said that, Abram, your descendants will be in a foreign nation and they'll be there about 400 years, which they end up being then in Egypt, 400 years, then uh, 430 to be exact, and then they come out in the Exodus. This was God's sovereign purpose and plan. And he had even specifically said this. And then all these different things that have happened, all the different even sins and, and misfortunes and sufferings in all of these different people's lives and, and specifically then in the life of Joseph. And it's all part of God's sovereign, beautiful, wonderful plan. It is. God is sovereign over all. He was sovereign then and He's sovereign today. That's why it's such a comforting truth. Comforting truth. Whatever we might face, we can rest our head on the pillow of the truth of God's sovereignty. God rules. He knows. I want to read a quote at this point uh, from a man, Henry M. Morris. He wrote a good commentary on Genesis. He's one of the kind of uh, young earth creationists, well known in the young earth creationist movement in the early days. Uh, Henry M. Morris says this regarding uh, Joseph and, and the situation here. He says, Furthermore, there is no greater example in the Bible of God's gracious watch and care over His own. A multiplicity of seemingly accidental and unrelated events Events which seem to be ugly and difficult at the time is gradually woven together by an unseen divine hand into a glorious tapestry in which every portion is ideally situated in its proper and unique place. To believers going through sufferings, and reverses, undeserved and unexplained. The story of Joseph has always given assurance of ultimate understanding. With the believer discovering a greater good and a God, and God receiving a greater glory than could ever have been possible without them. I like the way he uh, uses that. This ugly and indifferent and accidental, unrelated events, it's all part of God's sewing, 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 I can't say the word, Wo woven together by the unseen divine hand into a glorious tapestry. And that's what God does ultimately with everything. 
There is no accidents in this world. There are evil things and evil people will be judged and taken. Uh, they will stand in, into account for what they have done. But ultimately even everything is part of God's plan. And all of human history, all of it will ultimately be for the glory of God the greatness of God. And Joseph's story is just one of those kind of where we were given the details uh, in, in a um, more extended uh, way and as a, as a kind of clear example. But this is true even still today. God is sovereign. He's in control. And if it seemed like it was somehow distant in this unique situation, and if it seems to us that it's sometimes distant, we, sh we should be reminded of these truths. We should be reminded that God is always there. He's always faithful. And we need to be faithful to Him. But this was something God has promised would happen before. And He reminds Joseph, J Jacob as he goes into Egypt. Well, let me go on here in, this, in Genesis 46. Uh, verse 5 then Jacob set out from Beersheba. So now he's got his newfound confidence and trust in his God and he's revived. And this old man is going to Egypt. The sons of Israel carried Jacob, their father, and their little ones and their wives in the wagons that Pharaoh had sent to carry him. They also took their livestock and their goods, which they had gained in the land of Canaan, and came into Egypt, Jacob and all his offspring, literally Jacob and all his seed, in biblical language, seed is very important. Uh, seed, that which comes uh, from, from someone, whether it's even a plant or an or a animal or, or a human. Jacob and all his offspring with him, his sons, his sons' sons with him, his daughters and his sons' daughters, all his offspring he brought with him into Egypt. So there you are going. And now verses 8 to 26 we're given this kind of quite a long genealogy of Israel. That which is Israel at this point. The, the, you could say the founding uh, fathers and uh, mothers, uh, but the founding people of the nation of Israel, which total in 70 or 75, depending on how you count some of these things, but basically 70 and it is emphasized to us here now that this is Israel going into Egypt. There are about 70 people. 430 years later, as they come out, and the story of the Exodus and Moses and everything, there's a lot more of them. I won't go into the details of that. There's also then different kind of views on whether they were about 2.4 million of the Jewish people as they lived for the Exodus, or even a smaller group like something like 300,000. Uh, it's an interesting debate, and it has to do with different how different words in Hebrew are interpreted and so forth, and even kind of a case could be made a little bit both ways. Either way, this nation has grown considerably from the 70. It has grown and it has become something different. And then God, in His sovereign hand, is then leading them out 430 years later. But we're given here, and let me read verses 8 to 27. Uh, now these are the names of the descendants of Israel who came into Egypt, Jacob and his sons, Reuben, Jacob's firstborn, and the sons of Reuben, Hanok, Palu, Hezron, and Carmi, the sons of Simeon, Jemuel, Jamin, Ohad, Jachin, Zohar, and Shaul, the son of a Canaanite woman, the sons of Levi, Gershon, Kohat, and Merari, the sons of Judah, Er, Onan, Shelah, Perez, and Zerah, but Er and Onan died in the land of Canaan. And the sons of Perez were Hezron and Hamul, the sons of Issachar, Tola, Puva, Job, and Shimron, the sons of Zebulun, Sered, Elon, Jahlel. These are the sons of Leah, whom she bore to Jacob in Padan Aram, together with his daughter Dinah, 
Altogether, his sons and his daughters numbered 33. The sons of Gad, Zephion, Hagi, Shuni, Eshbon, Eri, Arodi, and Areli, the sons of Asher, Imna, Ishva, Ishvi, Beria, with Sarah, their sister, and the sons of Beria, Heber, and Malchiel. These are the sons of Zilpa, whom Laban gave to Leah, his daughter, and these she bore to Jacob, 16 persons. The sons of Rachel, Jacob's wife, Joseph, and Benjamin. And to Joseph, in the land of Egypt, were born Manasseh and Ephraim, whom Asenath, the daughter of Potipharah, the priest of On, bore to him. And the sons of Benjamin, Bela, Becher, Ashbel, Gera, Naaman, Ehi, Rosh, Muppim, Huppim, and Ard. These are the sons of Rachel who were born to Jacob, 14 persons in all. The sons of Dan, Hushim. The sons of Naphtali, Jazel, Guni, Jezer, and Shilam. These are the sons of Bilha, whom Laban gave to Rachel, his daughter. And these she bore to Jacob seven persons in all. All the persons belonging to Jacob who came into Egypt, who were his own descendants, not including Jacob's son's wives, were 66 persons in all. And the sons of Joseph who were born to him in Egypt were two. All the persons of the house of Jacob who came into Egypt were 70. I'm going to stop there in just a brief moment. I mean, there's a lot of then different kind of details and questions uh, regarding uh, the, some of these uh, de details of this genealogy. The, the big kind of issue here is, uh, for example, that it says here, total in 70. And then you might even be, well, didn't they just say 66? So what's the 70? Well, the 70 you get by adding Jacob, uh, Joseph, and uh, Joseph's two sons. But in, more than trickier, in the book of Acts, in the New Testament, Acts chapter 7, verse 14, uh, as Peter is there preaching, he refers to it, this and he says they were 75 in, uh, when they were taken to uh, Egypt, came, came to Egypt. And that seems to be that... Uh, Peter is referring to the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the Septuagint, which has here, if you look in the Septuagint of this Genesis 36, it also has the number 75, and it's a little bit like, how come it's from 70 to 75? Well, it's not a big difference, but where did, why is there a difference? It seems to then be maybe in how then the scribal changed Got there, why? What's the significance of that? But it seems to be that the way you would then get 75 is if you then add, if you think about Israel in totality, and you then think of Joseph's descendants that are further than born also in Egypt. So not just Manasseh and Ephraim, but uh, add, added more and uh, so forth. Then there's also even some, there, there's a few other kind of ways of thinking of this and maybe there was a daughter, another daughter of Jacob that's not mentioned because Dinah is mentioned but then it's in plural, so his daughter, so it's a little bit, maybe there was someone else. Either way, just want to make you aware of that but 70 or 75, but these, these people, these are the ones who came. This is what Israel is at this point. And from this group of people, God will make a great nation. So much so that Egypt will find it later a concern. Whether again, what exactly number that was, but they were beginning to be a power to be reckoned with in many ways. And the Egyptians are concerned. And then there's all the uh, plagues and things. And as Moses takes, uh, leads them out. Uh, and again, back into Canaan. This is what Israel is. Well, now let me close with ver the end of this chapter, kind of the, the actual meeting. Uh, verse 28 in Genesis 36. He had sent Judah, who? Jacob. 
Notice Judah is again the leader, Judah the changed man. It's not Reuben who's the leader, even though Reuben is the firstborn. Judah has stepped up to the plate, and Judah has, is, is clearly a different man again than he was earlier in his serious failings. Judah is sent as the representative to go ahead of him to Joseph and to show the way before him in Goshen. And they came into the land of Goshen. Then Joseph prepared his chariot and went up to meet Israel. His father in Goshen. Joseph is not just obviously waiting, okay, they'll, they'll make their way to my temple or my abode. Joseph wants to see his father. He, his father hasn't known that he's alive. He's hoped that his father is alive. Now he knows that his father is alive, but he hasn't seen his father. And he gets himself prepared and he goes there. He goes to find out Israel his father, and he presented himself to him and fell on his neck and wept on his neck for a good while. Imagine this. Imagine this. Some of you know a little bit, I'm sure, of, of this, you know, seeing a long uh, a family member or even father or mother you haven't seen in a long time or... or a, son or whatever it is and here it's in a, in a such a unique emotional moment they embrace each other undoubtedly it was joseph who was coming uh, because uh, jacob is an old man there he goes and they fell on his neck and they weep and notice they weep on his neck a good while so it's quite a it wasn't just a brief moment of tears and, okay, let's go on world with it. What do you have to offer here in Egypt? You know, it's nice to be here. Uh, you know, all that. Congratulations on your new promotion. No, it was a very emotional thing. And it, it, there's in some ways many parallels as we think about this. Also then when Jesus tells the parable uh, of, of the prodigal son returning to the father and the father embracing. Obviously there the son has done evil and his repentance and so, but again a father and a son reunited and, and the, the tears of joy that there is in that. What does Jacob now say who is emphasized that he is Israel? Verse 30, Israel said to Joseph, now let me die. Since I have seen your face and know that you are still alive. Now Jacob is at that point. Now, now he's fine with dying now. Before this he hasn't really wanted to die in the same way. Because he's lived with this big question mark. This strange thing that he lost his beloved son. Who has been thinking is dead. But also a bit probably uncertainty like... What was that all about? But now it's clear. He knows he's alive and he has seen him. Now the kind of, the, the, uh, this has been solved and he's seen him and he's okay. Everything's all right. And my descendants, everything. I, I, God, if you want to take me now, it's okay. Now I can die since I've seen your face and know that you're still alive. He will end up living about, I think, 17 years, if I remember, after this. Uh, but eventually he will die, and we'll see that in just a few chapters here in Genesis. But verse 31, Joseph said to his brothers and to his father's household, so after this emotional thing, he now, again, Joseph is an administrator, leader, he's very wise in the way he's even got to this point, and God has given him a lot of wisdom and skill and so forth, and he doesn't want to presume on any of this, and he also wants to now give his family uh, one advice, which basically his advice is just be flat out honest. Do not deceive this time. Do not deceive at all, thinking that it might be good for you to deceive. But actually, in this situation, the fact that you'll be flat out honest to Pharaoh will be a good thing to you. So just tell who you are and what you do for a living. <laughs> Say that you're shepherds. Say that you've been shepherds for a long time. And actually that will be a good thing and you will go. Do not be dishonest in any way. Uh, Jacob has a past of dishonesty. His sons as well, obviously. So 
says to his brothers and his father's household, I will go up and tell Pharaoh and I will say to him, my brothers and my father's household who were in the land of Canaan have come to me. So now they've come. And he, so Joseph will say this, and the men are shepherds for they have been keepers of livestock and they have brought their flocks and their herds and all the, that they have. When Pharaoh calls you and says, it's okay, I will, give, I will tell Pharaoh first, but then when Pharaoh tells you, don't you try and hide away and think that you want some other occupation. No, just be flat out honest. When Pharaoh says, what is your occupation? You shall say, your servants have been keepers of livestock from our youth even until now, both we and our fathers. And that's true. And just tell him that. And actually, there's an ad, at this point, it's an added benefit because this is what Joseph says. In order that you may dwell in the land of Goshen. So the land of Goshen is apparently like then the, the in some ways, the best part uh, of Egypt. But at the same time, it's a part where many of the Egyptians will happily send them for some reason. Because they don't want to be near shepherds. People who keep care of livestock. You may dwell in the land of Goshen for every shepherd is an abomination to the Egyptians. There's then been kind of a lot of writing here like what exactly does this mean? Because even as we'll see here later on, Pharaoh has his own livestock also. So it's not that they're against like sheep or cattle or animals or that they don't want anyone to do it. But it seems to be that what it means that they have abominations. They don't want those smelly farmers too close. And probably even more than these uh, foreign farmers. Uh, we've seen that, that the Egyptians wouldn't sit and eat with the Hebrews. They would have this kind of thing. And, and uh, so, and maybe, you know, maybe in our modern society, some of us can you know, relate, like, okay, there's a reason why maybe there isn't like huge uh, flocks of animals right in the center of a Tampere or something and many people would find it unsettling to their sophisticated uh, cleanliness protocols and, and such. They would be a little bit as as afraid of that. Uh, and uh, so some, something similar. Okay, so abomination to the Egyptians, so put them away. But actually, their Goshen is better for us anyway. That's where we want to go. So be honest, say it as such. And this is how God will provide for you. And that's where they go. And that's where they're going to then be made into this great nation in the sovereign, wise plan of God. It's easy now to say when you see it all come together. It's easy to say then when you see like, okay, Yes, well, this is great. This is a nice, you know, end to the story. The family saved, you know, their reunion. But then, in this situation, with Joseph, 23 years of uncertainty, suffering, and bitterness, and hardship, and unjust treatment, and all these kind of things, and people doing wicked things, and yet this was part of God's plan for Joseph, God's plan for Egypt in some certain ways also, but in, the, in a unique way, God's plan for the nation of Israel to provide for them and prepare them according to his wise purpose. And eventually from the tribe of Judah will come David, the great king, and then from David will come the son of David, the king of kings, the Lord of lords, the Lord Jesus Christ, in whom all the promises of God are yes and, 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 yes and amen and find their final fulfillment and the promise given to Abraham so long ago that in Abraham's seed all the nations of the earth will find blessing. That comes to its final and fullest fruition and we are partakers of that. We are partakers of that when we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. We have been blessed by eternal life and forgiveness of sin in Him.
So whatever you might face in your life today, tomorrow or the next week or next year, whenever, however God, God gives us life and breath, whether it's joy or difficulty, trials or pain or uncertainty, unjust treatment, whatever it might be, and I know this is always easier said than done, but we need to be reminded of this. God is really sovereign. He really is. He really is. And we need to be men and women of faith, men who trust God, who believe God's word, trust Him in all things, and trust Him with our life and our life cir circumstances. And then realize that there are periods of life then that are preparing for something we might not realize and know. And, and there's dark valleys at times and such. And at the end of the day, there's going to be a day when I realize why all this happened. There's going to be a day when I realize even the little things. And I will praise God for His wisdom. And I will praise God for His justice and ju judging all evildoers and all. And I will praise Him for His mercy toward me, a foolish, disobedient sinner, as so many times. All of it will make sense one day. Finally, and we will see the glory of God displayed in all of the history of God's creation and the history of mankind. And Joseph is a little snapshot and a little piece of the puzzle uh, of that story. Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you that you are sovereign. You are the ruler of heaven and earth. Lord, help us to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, that we might turn to you. Help us to be like Jacob at his best moments. And there he, he turned to you, he worshipped you, and you spoke to him. Before he left Egypt, he turned to you. Help us in our daily life, in little situations or big situations, in our everyday life, help us not to forget that, but that we might turn to you we might call upon the name of our God and that we might remember that in the Lord Jesus Christ we have bold access to the throne of grace. He is the promised one. So Lord, help us to learn from this, help us to gain comfort from this, help us to learn from all the warnings and the failures even of these great men and that we might Live in light of that which you have spoken, that which you have said. Be with us this coming week and bless us in all things. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.